We're, we're going to go ahead and get started. And once again, welcome. We are excited to have you here today. Uh, my name is Jessica Swan, and I am your community manager for the Infiniscope project. Uh, today, we gather together for the third presentation in our series uh, for the Heliophysics Big Year. So if you're not aware of the Heliophysics Big Year, actually started last year. Um, and actually, it started in 2023 that is last year, uh, with the um, annular eclipse that happened in October, continued through the total solar eclipse in April, and will conclude when Parker Solar Probe makes its closest approach to the sun on December 24th of this year. Uh, also, over the course of this year, and I think even into next year, we are approaching solar maximum, which is why we see so many great aurora. Um, our guest speaker with us here today is Vincent Ledvina. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him here in just a second, but Vincent's going to talk with us today all about the Aurora, which is nature's most spectacular light show. Uh, before we do that, uh, just a brief overview of what is Infiniscope and what does Infiniscope offer. So we have a whole slew of classroom ready content. So if you're looking for digital learning experiences or you just wanna explore on your own, we have many different learning experiences available. So you can investigate Earth's interior. You can check out things like why do seasons occur? Um, how do these eclipses work? We also offer things in Spanish. So if you prefer Spanish, we have that available. And one of our most recent learning experiences is on ocean acidification. Not only do we create content, but we also provide tools for educators to create their own digital learning experiences. So our two tools are Turret and the Simple Lesson Builder. Um, the Turret tool allows you to create your own virtual field trips. And then the Simplified Lesson uh, Builder allows you to actually create uh, interactive digital lessons that uses leverages intelligent tutoring to kind of create your own choose your own adventure style sort of lessons. We do offer training on all of these aspects. So do be sure to check out the Infiniscope events page to learn more about upcoming opportunities. And without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Vincent Ledvina. Vincent is a space physics PhD candidate and hails from University of Alaska Fairbanks. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Vincent. All right, Let's thank you so much. Here. Yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. I will begin sharing my screen and we can get started. So. Uh, yeah, my name is Vincent Ledvina. I'm a PhD student here at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, uh, which is where I'm calling from today. So good morning or good afternoon. It's currently 9 a.m. here in Alaska, so probably a few hours behind most of you. But I'm really excited here today uh, to talk about the Aurora, something I'm super passionate about. So just a quick outline of uh, what I'll be talking about today. Um, I'll be going over a little bit more about my background and sort of how I became quote unquote the Aurora guy because that's what some people call me um, and just share some really cool adventures and uh, you know obviously some really cool photos too of the Aurora and uh, all the Aurora chasing I've done and then I'll go into really the science which is what is space weather and what is the Aurora um, you know it's really really interesting because the Aurora is not only beautiful um, but there's really uh, interesting science behind it and also space weather can affect your daily life. Uh, then there's going to be a fun activity, and then we're going to get into some weird kinds of aurora and also how you can be an aurora scientist, and you will all be aurora scientists today. So my aurora origin story uh, started all the way back in 2003 when I was four years old. So I was growing up in Minnesota, and I actually saw the aurora um, when I was trick-or-treating um, during this Halloween uh, storm. There was a really, really big solar storm October 31st of 2003, and I remember seeing the aurora sort of dancing above my my childhood home in Minnesota and not knowing what it was. So um, I later learned it was Northern Lights and I just became really interested in the outdoors, um, camping, nature, the stars, astronomy. Uh, I was in Boy Scouts. I was always out, you know, I was out always outdoors with my camera, taking photos of the natural uh, world around me. And um, uh, I became really interested in photography when I was in middle school, developed uh, a passion for that. And then I really discovered auroras and space weather um, uh, sort of around the same time 
And everything sort of coalesced into this passion of Aurora chasing. I took my first Aurora photo when I was 16. And then I moved to North Dakota uh, to go to school there for my bachelor's and studied physics. And then while I was at UND, University of North Dakota, I sort of became this Aurora guy uh, figure. I started taking photos of the Aurora going out in the middle of nowhere, you know, uh, trying to chase these northern lights. And then at one point, the University of North Dakota posted one of my photos on their on their site, on their uh, website and on their Instagram. And then all of a sudden I had people on campus coming up to me asking me if I was, quote unquote, that Aurora guy. And my friends made fun of me. Um, they said, oh, you're this Aurora guy now. And at first I was kind of, you know, hesitant. But after a while, I realized, you know, I just do Aurora stuff. This is like my passion and I've just been interested in it for so long. So I've now embraced the uh, moniker, the Aurora guy. So um, I did a lot of Aurora chasing when I was up in North Dakota. I uh, had a lot of really great internship opportunities as well. Uh, interned with the National Solar Observatory. I was a, I was a NASA summer intern, uh, interned at a company in San Diego. Um, and got a lot of experience with uh, space weather um, while I was an undergrad. And Aurora chasing has taken me a lot of really cool places. I've seen the Aurora in some really crazy locations and done some crazy things. So uh, one of the coolest things I've done was go to Churchill, Manitoba, right on the Hudson Bay. So the image on the left there is actually looking over the Hudson Bay. Um, and that's in northern Canada where polar bears are. So um, while, while we were here this time in March, we didn't see any polar bears um, but we did see polar bears in September when we were there. Uh, this is in 2022, later in, later in this year. So I saw po four polar bears. One of them was about as close um, as you are probably to your teacher right now. It was We almost ran into them as we were rounding a, co rounding a corner. So yeah, these things are massive. They're beautiful, but definitely kind of extreme aurora chasing um, up in northern Canada. But um, the photos were amazing. And, you know, if you've never seen the aurora, it's this... Uh, vibrant thing. It's not just static either. It moves. Uh, it sort of swirls around the sky. It can have really cool uh, rapid motion. It's just beautiful. So that image on the left, or sorry, that video on the left um, is a video, uh, a, you know, a real-time video of the image on the right. So, you know, with one camera uh, just taking a still photo, you don't get the full experience. You really have to be there um, and look up and see this thing move because it is just amazing. So, uh, these these photos and videos that you're seeing now come from northern Alaska. I was up in uh, Fort Yukon staying at an army or sorry, an Air Force uh, base up there for a few weeks, helping out with a sounding rocket, NASA sounding rocket campaign. So that was really, really cool, um, which was also in 2022. That's above the Arctic Circle. And now um, I'm up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, studying space physics, going for my Ph.D. I actually live in a town called North Pole, which is really funny. Um, to say because it's you know we get a lot of actually the uh, post office in North Pole gets all the letters from Santa so uh, it's pretty it's pretty funny over 50,000 letters every single year and I'm sharing my love for the Aurora I just love this stuff I think it's so cool um, you know it's just beautiful but it also is so scientifically interesting and it also can affect your daily lives so it's not just a pretty uh, sight in the sky it really touches the lives of so many people in so many different ways um, I'm a photographer I do uh, photography professionally I'm a citizen scientist, so I'm using my photos for research and collaborating with scientists. Um, and you can all do that as well, which I'll be talking about later. And I'm also researching the auroras as well. So space weather uh, refers to conditions around a star like our sun and its interplanetary space that may affect space and ground-based assets as well as human life. But really, you know, that might sound like a mouthful. Really, it just boils down to the aurora. The aurora is such a good um, way to express space weather. It really ties everything together. It not only shows... Um, what's going on in our atmosphere, but it shows the energy coming from the sun going down into the Earth's sort of magnetic shield, um, all the electricity from space, it really ties everything together. So when I say, you know, if you don't know what space weather is, just look up and look at the aurora. And it's a lot more than the aurora, of a lot more than the aurora, of course, there's all sorts of things going on in outer space, which I'll talk about um, briefly. But just to give you just to sort of whet your appetite, there's you know, incredible space missions like Parker Solar Probe, uh, which will be making its closest approach to the sun uh, later this year, actually on Christmas Eve. There's solar flares, big explosions of uh, plasma called coronal mass ejections. There's shock waves. There's um, giant magnets in space. There's all this stuff going on. So space is not empty. Space is full of these things called space weather. And it all starts with the sun, just like we have Earth, or sorry, just like we have weather on the Earth, we have rain and clouds and storms. Uh, the sun also creates uh, similar weather in space, rain, 
uh, clouds and storms and wind. And really the sun is what drives all this. The sun is what drives all this space weather. And from the ground, you know, we obviously know what the sun is and we see it and it just looks like this sort of white disc, this sort of bright thing that you're not supposed to look at. But when we go out into space, scientists have these special sunglasses they can put on their instruments and their telescopes, and they can see the sun in, in a totally different way. So what we're used to is sort of, you know, a white disc or this continuum, this sort of yellow sun here. But when you put on different filters, you can see the magnetic fields on the sun. You can see all the energy um, coming off into outer space in really cool and unique ways. And the sun is not just the static object. It's really dynamic. So uh, when you put on these special sunglasses, you can see all this activity going on um, on the sun, these explosions called coronal mass ejections, solar flares. Uh, you can see that the sun is sort of bubbling with all this energy. Uh, you can see that the surface is not just a, a you know, perfect sort of circle. There's all these little uh, flares and little um, you know, tendrils coming off. So you know, the sun is not just the static thing. It really is ever changing uh, on the order of minutes, hours, um, you know, even seconds. And the sun really blows uh, a wind through space, which is kind of uh, what space weather is all uh, focused around is this idea of solar wind. You know, the sun gives us warmth and life, but it also gives us space weather. The sun is constantly changing, as I was saying, and it creates this wind that blows out called the solar wind. It's almost like if you have a hot cup of coffee and that coffee in the center of the mug is the sun and uh, that steam coming off is the solar wind. So it's usually calm and it sort of just uh, flows around all the planets in the solar system. Uh, out to the very edge of the solar system, um, but sometimes it can be really strong and fierce. And uh, the solar wind carries with it charged particles, which have um, you know magnetic fields and electricity with them. And uh, Earth has its own magnetic field, so you can imagine when these two magnets essentially come together, uh, you can get interesting things going on. And Earth is thankfully protected from this uh, solar wind, which can carry with it a lot of highly charged particles and radiation. Um, luckily, we have a magnetic shield. It's kind of like a force field that protects us. You know, Earth has its own magnetic field. You've all used a compass before. Well, that magnetic field extends out into space and sort of forms a bubble around us, which is called the magnetosphere. So when some of the sun's wind uh, hits our bubble, some of the electricity in the wind sort of flows in. And when our magnetic shield charges up um, from this wind hitting it, sort of compresses it, um, we can get uh, auroras around the geomagnetic poles. And so what is the aurora exactly? Well, it's nature's most beautiful light show, um, but it's really formed the same way actually that a neon lamp uh, works. You have charged particles from space. Um, these charged particles are streaming along magnetic field lines like surfers on waves. Um, so you have all this energy from the solar wind. It hits our magnetic shield and some of that makes it through and it gets funneled over the poles. This energy comes down into our atmosphere, but luckily our atmosphere is also protecting us. So it eventually hits particles um, in the upper atmosphere and sort of um, energizes them. And in that process releases light in specific colors. So we have nitrogen atoms that glow uh, red and blue, and we have oxygen that glows red and green. And um, you can see here on the right, the different colors actually occur at different altitudes. So uh, red is usually above the green, which is above this, um, what's called a nitrogen fringe, which is below 60 miles. So um, if you've ever seen the aurora really, really dance, you'll actually see it sort of uh, grow this little fringe at the bottom, uh, which is caused by really high energy particles coming down and piercing our atmosphere. And the auroras are created really high up in the atmosphere. So I was saying, um, you know, particles from outer space, well, our atmosphere starts way, way high up above our heads, actually. So we breathe air down here in the troposphere, um, which is, you know, barely registering on this graph, but the aurora really occur all the way up here in the E and the F uh, region. So this is 15 to 50 times higher than a plane flies, which means that if you want to see the aurora, it has to be clear outside. You can't see it when there's clouds because the aurora occurs above the clouds. And the ionosphere is called the ionosphere because there's ions or charged particles um, that make up this layer of the atmosphere. So um, this is also electrified. So when you have two, you know, sort of, I guess, like electric currents coming together, one from outer space and one in the atmosphere, um, it can cause the gas to glow. Um, in specific colors like green, red, and blue. And it's exactly the same way that a neon lamp works. It's just that in this case, our electricity is coming from outer space, from Earth's magnetic field. And in the neon lamp's case, it's coming from the wall, right? Um, and again, the neon lamp can glow specific colors um, as well. So it's just like a giant neon lamp in the sky, essentially. 
And you can see the Aurora um, every single night if you wanted to. You just have to travel to a place underneath one of the auroral ovals. So when this energy comes in, it's funneled towards Earth's poles. So that's why you see Aurora in places like Alaska or Norway or Iceland all the time, because it's underneath these auroral ovals. Of course, it needs to be clear and dark um, to see the Aurora. You can't see it during the daytime and it needs to uh, be clear. You can't have any clouds. And during what are called geomagnetic storms, when the solar wind blows really hard and when there's sort of these gusts of solar wind, which I'll talk about later, uh, you could actually see the Aurora from your own backyard. These auroral ovals expand and the auroras can be seen from lower latitudes. So the sun can get really angry. These gentle breezes of space weather can turn into giant storms. Uh, the sun sort of releases these sneezes, which are kind of big clouds of charged particles um, out into space. And these usually take around one to three days to reach Earth. And when they come close to our planet, um, this sort of sun sneeze um, has its own magnetic field and its own sort of magnetic bubble. And it can, uh, it can sort of bounce off our magnetic field or it can sort of link up and all that energy can then flow down um, over the poles, into the poles and charge up the aurora really, really strong and cause those auroral ovals to grow and expand. So we saw this happen actually just last week. We had auroras as far south as Arizona um, and as far south as Cuba and Puerto Rico. So uh, that's not normal, right? We had one of these really, really strong sun sneezes. And so, yeah, I was just saying last week, um, I should have updated the slide because uh, it seems like we've had tons of auroras this year. We've had two really, really big storms. We had one in May, and then we had one exactly five months later, um, just last week on, on October 10th. So uh, we've had some really uh, nice space weather that have given us some really great auroral displays. And that's because we're in solar maximum. So um, Jessica earlier was saying, you know, we're in this heliophysics big year. Well, actually, NASA and NOAA just a few days ago declared that we are in solar maximum officially. So that means that the sun is more active. It goes through this activity cycle. You can see here there's sort of high periods and there's low periods. And right now we're in one of these high periods. So that means that there's more space weather activity and more chances of these big, strong auroral displays. And space weather can affect you. Um, it's not just auroras, but uh, space weather can cause issues for technology in outer space and on the ground. So it's important um, that we study what the aurora is doing and also what space weather is doing so we can better understand these impacts. And one uh, really famous event was the Carrington event in 1859, where uh, we had a sun sneeze or a coronal mass ejection that was so strong um, that all the technology on Earth, essentially, which was just telegraphs, were knocked out. And auroras were seen basically around the entire world. So you can see here there was a a newspaper clipping um, that just highlighted that. Auroras were so bright you could read the newspaper underneath them um, in Boston, which is not normal. So now uh, this is kind of going on to our activity. Um, what I would like you to do, and I think we can post the link in the chat, is we have some Aurora photos um, that I have compiled um, in a slideshow. And you can just go to this link, uh, bit.ly slash aurora-activity, which will pull up um, a slideshow of these Aurora photos. And what I want you to do is just, um, whether that's you know individually or in small groups, um, go through the photos and just kind of look at what you're seeing. Uh, colors, brightness, uh, shapes, like um, they're just gonna be photos of the Aurora that I've taken. And you can just you know comment to yourself or um, however you wanna do it, sort of what you're seeing. And uh, this will all make sense in about five minutes when we reconvene. But yeah, just spend 40 to 60 seconds per photo. I think there's eight photos in there. Um, and just sort of, um, you know, make some observations, right? What kind of colors are you seeing? Are the auroras in one line? Are they multiple lines? Is it is it a really bright aurora? Is it really dim? Um, you know, what season is it? Is there snow on the ground? Things like that. Um, so uh, we can all look at those photos and then um, in like, I guess, four minutes or so, um, come back and I will tell you what I was thinking for all the photos. So I've, I've also done this activity. So I have, I have my own thoughts as well. So it'll be interesting. Okay, everyone, I've dropped the link over in the chat. So sh you should be able to click on that and access the images. And we'll be back in four or five minutes.
hopefully you all got a chance to look at so hopefully you all got a chance to look at the uh, images there in the slide deck. Um, so these are all images that I've taken um, around, uh, well, actually uh, not just around uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, where I live, but uh, this one was. So this was taken just last winter. And if you notice, it's really very green. It's really bright. Um, it's almost so bright that the snow is green. So uh, that's something that we experience up here in Alaska is when the aurora is really bright, you can actually see the snow glowing, which is just really, really cool. And also, if you notice, um, there's really no aurora to the left of this uh, big aurora here. It's obviously winter because there's snow on the ground. Um, there's some sort of fuzzy aurora kind of to the right of these main bands here. You can see that within these bands, there's a lot of like substructure, right? A lot of really fine details. Like, and we're going to see that throughout all these photos is that it's not just, you know, just one line. If you actually look very closely, there's sort of bands, there's little lines, grooves, um, little kind of ripples and things like that. Um, for this one, you know, much different, right? The aurora is not as bright. Um, you can see the snow was, was, was very green in the, in the last image, but uh, it's not in this one. So that means that the aurora is probably much dimmer. There's more stars as well. Uh, it means that maybe we were using a longer exposure because the aurora wasn't as bright. A longer exposure with our camera means that we can let in more light and also means more stars. Um, and there's also some glow over here. So maybe that's light pollution. It's not green. So maybe it's, it's probably not Aurora, right? Um, there's some red colors as well, which we didn't see in the last photo. And obviously it's winter. Now this one is way different. This one's mostly purple Aurora, which is really, really different. We can even see a little bit of blue here. Um, we also notice that the Aurora seems to be sort of streaming down from like one point. It almost looks like, like rays coming down, like almost like sunbeams or um, something like that. So that's different. Um, we can also see that we're in like a campground or something. Uh, maybe that doesn't have to do so much with the Aurora, but um, might tell us about where we are, um, help pinpoint the location. Looks like uh, we're, we're in the winter time again. There's no snow on the trees, so maybe it's later in the winter since the snow is blown off. Um, that's kind of Fairbanks insider knowledge there. I'm not expecting you to realize that, but um, there's also some fuzzy or diffuse Aurora kind of you know, towards this tree line here. Um, we don't really know which direction we're facing. So maybe this is north, maybe this is south. It's kind of hard to tell just from this image. Now, this one is very different, right? There's no green at all in this one, basically. Maybe a little bit at the bottom. So you might be able to say, okay, well, remember that uh, color diagram that I showed you where you have the green and then the red. This kind of shows that, but most of it's red. So maybe the particles coming in aren't able to make it to those, to those lower altitudes. So maybe they're really low energy particles, right? They aren't able to to pierce as far down into the atmosphere. So yeah, and this aurora looks to be pretty bright. The ground is actually going red in this case, not green. There's a lot of stars. You can even see this little galaxy right here. This is Andromeda. Now this one is really weird too. Uh, we got a green aurora. So, you know, we're right on track there, but a lot of weird sort of curly structures like a snake, it's very twisted. Um, there's some aurora glow maybe to the right of the image here. And of course the ground is, ground is green again. This one was actually taken in my backyard <laughs> just a few weeks ago, and it almost looks like the bat symbol. Um, and you can see the image is sort of warped. It almost looks like we're, we have like a fisheye lens going on. Uh, it's not winter. The snow is, or there's, there's no snow. The ground isn't frozen. Um, it's now snowy here. We just got snow yesterday. So if I would, if I were to take an image in my backyard now, there's tons of snow on the ground now. So um, fall does not last too long up here in Alaska, but there's also some weird like substructures like, almost looks like a sort of lace uh, dress or something. There's like all these weird sort of ripples. Um, this one is really cool. This was actually a few days before the last image. I took this one. Um, cool pink colors here. This shows the, that, that color diagram perfectly. You have the green, then you have the red, and then you can actually get a mixing between the blue and the, and the red to get this purple. So we have really interesting colors here. Um, a lot of stars. Uh, it seems like the whole sky is full of aurora. And I think uh, somebody compared this to a hurricane. Yeah, this is what I like to call the aurora cinnamon roll. So, yeah, the first thing that jumps out at you is that uh, this is a really interesting shape. It's like a whole curl, a whole spiral, a whole cinnamon roll. I must have been hungry when I was thinking about that. Um, but, yeah, I saw this actually in Churchill, Manitoba. So this was, uh, we actually saw a polar bear later this night. Um, so that was pretty interesting, <laughs> a little scary. But um, this Aurora was awesome. It was super, super bright. It's actually so bright that it's white on my camera, which means that um, it's a little bit overexposed. So uh, and there's Aurora 
kind of filling the entire sky here. There's some here on the left, maybe a little bit here on the right, but really it's this spiral that's just, you know, so striking. And, you know, looking at these Aurora images, you might say, okay, what's the point of doing this, right? Well, this is actually how scientists do research. I mean, I do this every single day um, in, in a grad school and looking at, you know, what kind of Auroras we're seeing and, you know, the shapes of the Auroras matter a lot. The colors matter a lot. And um, what direction the aurora is in, how bright the aurora is in, the height of the aurora. You know, if you're seeing a lot of red auroras, those occur really high up in the atmosphere. So that means the aurora is really, really tall and it's occurring in a different location than the green. So that's really important. The patterns in the aurora kind of correspond. You know, if you think about the aurora, sort of these this, this raining down of electricity or particles, the patterns in the aurora, those spirals kind of correspond to the clouds in outer space that are raining down those particles. So that's kind of, you know, going back to the idea of space weather is that we not only have the rain of the aurora coming down, but we also have the clouds that can produce the rain. And the types of auroras we see in the atmosphere um, correspond to the types of clouds in outer space that are responsible for that particle precipitation of the aurora. So yeah, I've used, I mean, what you guys just did is aurora science. That is really what it boils down to. And that's half of the battle is just figuring out what is going on. And we use imagery really primarily to do our research. We take photos of the night sky and then we take those photos back to the lab and say, okay, what, like, what did we just see? Um, and we go and apply special filters to those photos. We um, take videos and we can see the evolution of the aurora. So this is actually, this circle here is a, if you imagine you're laying down on the ground and you can see the whole sky as sort of a fisheye, all sky lens, kind of like a planetarium, you can see the aurora throughout the entire sky. So this is really common to see these all sky images. And when I was in Fort Yukon, Alaska, um, I was doing this research in this type of uh, analysis that you all did, um, constantly taking photos of the aurora and figuring out when we see a specific type of aurora, we have to launch that rocket because that's what we want to see. So what you all did is basically <laughs> what I've been doing for the past four years, what I'll be doing for the rest of my PhD. So it's really not that hard. It's, it's, it's really fun. Um, just going through and looking at aurora photos uh, is, is, is real science. And you know, through this, you know, aurora chasers are, are out there looking at the aurora all the time and have discovered some really weird things. So um, that's what I'm going to be talking about next are some weird types of auroras. Um, and, uh, you know, we all saw pictures of sort of normal auroras. You know, they all look different, but these are just weird ones. So we have Steve, and I kid you not, this is the real name of the thing. Steve, we have fragmented aurora-like emissions, which are these little green, like tic-tac type looking things. We have what's called Ragda or red aurora with green diffuse arc, which is uh, this formation. Then we have these dunes. So if you've ever seen the aurora, uh, you can take a photo of it and submit it to um, online uh, databases and projects and have your photos used for research. And you can help discover things like, like these weird types of aurora. So let's get into what Steve is. Um, I'm sure there's some chuckles going on. This is a real thing. It stands for Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. It was, it's not necessarily a new type of aurora. All these auroras have occurred for as long as uh, the Earth has had a magnetic field, right? And the sun has been blowing on a solar wind. But um, really, we didn't notice Steve until recently in 2018. This is a very new discovery. Um, we had aurora chasers in Alberta that were noticing this weird white, whitish aurora that was appearing to the east and to the west instead of to the north, like the normal aurora would. They started taking photos of it. They said, hmm, this looks a lot like a proton arc, which is something that's discussed in the scientific papers. Then scientists actually, um, they, you know, they, they sort of came to these aurora chasers and they were like, hey, what is this thing that you're seeing? And the aurora chaser said, oh, it's a proton arc. And the scientists said, no, 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 that's not a proton arc. This is something completely different. Um, we're going to sort of go back to the lab and sort of investigate this. And then in the meantime, the citizen scientists, these aurora chasers said, well, what are we going to call this thing? And then they said, let's name it Steve. <laughs> so if you've ever seen the movie Over the Hedge, um, you know, Steve is what's beyond the hedge. It's sort of the scary, it's like all the humans, right? The new development moving in. Um, and to make it sound less scary, they name it Steve. So that's where that that's where the name comes from, is this child movie, just childhood movie called Over the Hedge. So um, that might be beyond all all of your times, but I remember watching that when I was a kid. So um, it's actually not a normal aurora. You know, I was saying that auroras are formed by electricity coming down from outer space into the atmosphere, sort of like raining down. But Steve is actually produced by a white hot flow of gas. So if you ever heated up metal really, really hot, it starts glowing. It's the same thing in the Earth's upper atmosphere. We have these rivers 
of uh, gas that are so hot that they start to glow white. And that's why that's why Steve looks white instead of a normal green color. So yeah, auroras usually occur and um, emit uh, colors in very specific wavelengths. So green, blue, and red, basically though, basically that's it. But Steve is sort of a combination of all these colors and it's, and it's a white emission. We have friends of Steve, so the family of Steve and the friend network of Steve is growing. We have uh, Ragda, which is a red aurora with green diffuse arc. We also have these things called stable auroral red arcs. So these are um, mostly subvisual, although you can see them if they're bright enough. And I know that star arcs were visible during the big storm last week. So if you saw a really, really red aurora, you might have actually seen a star arc. Um, and these star arcs are known to evolve into Steve. So they're kind of like Steve's dad or like the precursor to Steve. So aurora chasers are, you know, looking at all these aurora photos and they're out there all the time and they're discovering things that scientists haven't seen or haven't realized are important. Um, so it's really, really cool. We have auroral dunes and I'm not going to um, pretend like I, I, I'm an expert in sort of lower atmosphere things, but you have these gravity waves that propagate up from lower altitudes. So you have these ripples and sometimes you can see them in clouds, actually, if you've ever noticed like these really evenly spaced clouds, um, those are actually gravity waves. But uh, if, if they're high enough uh, up in the atmosphere, they can be seen in the aurora, which is really, really cool. And they look like sand dunes. These were discovered in 2020. We also have fragmented aurora-like emissions or FAEs. And these are really, these are my favorite. Um, I, will, I will admit my bias uh, here, but they're like little green Tic Tacs or blobs. And they're just really, really strange. Um, what's really interesting is that you know, when the aurora particles come down, this electricity comes down from outer space, it's uh, relatively aligned with Earth's magnetic fields. So like I was saying, these surfers are riding waves, right? These waves are coming down at very specific angles. And, you know, we can sort of map these waves out into space. Well, these Tic Tacs are like not aligned at all to these waves. They're sort of coming off of the side, like little, you know, spokes on a wheel. Um, so it's really strange. And we don't really know what, what they're caused by, um, but we need more observations. So um, I'm part of this group, um, this sort of international group of scientists that's looking at Aurora Chasers photos and asking people to look back and see if, if, if they've seen these little, these little Aurora Tic Tacs, as I like to call them. But um, curiously enough, they look like the streaks seen in Steve's picket fence. So I mentioned this white emission, but uh, Steve also has these picket fence features that come down right below that white streak. And um, sometimes they look like little messy exclamation points where you have the streak, or sorry, you have the picket fence and then this little dot or blob of aurora that sort of comes off at a weird angle. And that might be very similar to these fragments that we're seeing. And you can do Aurora Citizen Science. You can, you can be a part of all these investigations um, through projects like Aurorasaurus. So um, I actually was an Aurorasaurus intern um, back in the day. You can visit aurorasaurus.org and you can report whether you've seen aurora or not. And those reports go on a map. Um, so you can see here, this was actually during the May 2024 event. We had a huge geomagnetic storm and over 5,000 people reported the aurora on Aurorasaurus. And that helps, that helps aurora chasers understand where the aurora is being seen. And also a map of these aurora reports over time can help scientists understand, like if there's a big space weather storm, you know, what is the aurora doing as a response, right? Um, so if you go to aurorasaurus.org, even saying that you haven't seen the aurora is super important. So, um, you know, if it's cloudy, um, but there might be aurora above your head, you know, go to aurorasaurus and say, you know, I'm really sad. I'm not seeing the aurora right now, but I want to help science. Um, I've definitely been doing that um, recently. It's been super cloudy here in Fairbanks. But yeah, your reports are really helpful. So uh, this is one way where you all can be directly involved in aurora science by visiting aurorasaurus.org. And you all could become Aurora Chasers as well. Um, all it takes is a love for the night sky and some patience. And it's easier than you probably think. Um, the science is super interesting, but, you know, the Auroras are always there. Um, the Auroras, you know, are, have been doing their thing for billions of years. So all it takes is, you know, travel to Alaska, travel to Iceland or Norway, and just sit out underneath the sky and wait for the Auroras to appear. Because up here in North Pole, Alaska, where I live, um, literally every single night there's Aurora. You just have to wait. You know, sometimes you don't have to wait long. They're right out after sunset, but other times it's just sort of a, a, a waiting game and you have to have some patience. You can also wait for space weather um, to become really intense and those auroral ovals to expand um, down to your latitude. So, you know, I'm sure most of you heard about the Aurora last week. Um, you don't have to wait, <laughs> hopefully, too much longer for one of those events to happen. 
uh, soon because we're in solar maximum, but uh, you don't necessarily have to travel to Alaska either um, to see the aurora. You can maybe see it from your own backyard. And you are all aurora scientists now. You all just uh, looked at photos of the aurora and, um, you know, were able to say, like, what colors were you seeing in the sky? Was it, was it a green aurora, purple aurora, red aurora? Um, and that's really what it boils down to is um, looking at aurora photos and um, just sort of observing what you see going out into the natural world and making observations. And this is something that you all can do. Um, it's something that I realized I wanted to do fairly early because I just had this, you know, love for uh, science, the night sky and astronomy. Um, but there's so many pathways you can choose um, to study this phenomenon of the aurora borealis and also space weather in general. Um, you know, space weather is very uh, important to uh, study and um, you know, it affects all of our daily lives. I didn't really touch on this a whole lot before, but, you know, auroras, when the aurora is really, really strong, it sort of tells us that Earth's magnetic shield, our force field is working really, really hard um, to protect us against space weather. So uh, we can use the aurora as sort of a, 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 a tool to understand how the Earth is responding to a big space weather storm. And if you're really interested in, you know, exploring more projects, there's a bunch of different ones out there. And this is sort of um, you know, a bunch of these different citizen science projects. So Aurora Soros is one, um, but there's also the Globe at Night project, which helps map uh, light pollution. Um, there's uh, the HARP project where you can actually listen to um, these sort of space weather clouds in outer space. They, they've taken these, these data from satellites, from satellites in outer space around Earth, and they've turned them into music. And you can actually look, you can actually listen to them and when you uh, hear specific little chirps or tones in, in the music, that actually corresponds to something uh, scientifically interesting. So you can mark those and help scientists better understand what's going on. Um, but there's a huge um, plethora of citizen science projects that you all could get involved in if this is something that you're interested in. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to talk about that more uh, after the presentation. But, you know, really what it boils down to and what I want to get uh, across is that you know, now is a really, really good time to be an aurora chaser. It's a really, 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 really good time um, to start looking into heliophysics and, you know, observing these natural phenomena that are gracing our skies um, and not just the skies in the, you know, northern latitudes in the Arctic regions. But when we have these severe, these really extreme and powerful space weather storms, we can get auroras down to very lower, uh, very, very low latitudes like, you know, Arizona, California. Um, Colorado, Utah all saw the aurora last week, right? So, you know, we are in solar maximum officially now. And it's not just this year, but the next couple of years are going to be a really, really good uh, times to observe the aurora. There's going to be a lot of activity. Uh, space weather can affect your daily lives. Um, it can, you know, damage satellites in space. It can cause, you know, power grid uh, failures, just like other natural disasters here on the ground that we're more familiar with, like, um, you know, hurricanes, for example. Um, it's just, there, it's just space weather is not as well known, uh, which is a shame because it's super, super interesting. And the aurora is a visual manifestation of the power of uh, space weather. And you can all be space weather scientists. Uh, you've proven that today. And there's lots of contributions to be made through citizen science projects that you can um, get involved in, um, which I just showed earlier, all these different projects that you can uh, participate in and help, um, you know, aurora science and uh, heliophysics move forward. So with that, thank you for your attention. And then I will have a page on my website. I'm just, uh, I'll be getting that up later today uh, with tons of resources. This slide deck will be available. Um, those images that you saw earlier will all be available and a bunch of other resources. If you want to learn more about, you know, let's say solar flares or coronal mass ejections, these things that, you know, I just briefly mentioned earlier, but really could take an entire lecture, you know, an entire hour to explain. Um, I'll have more information on those on this website as well. So with that, thank you all for your attention, and uh, I guess we'll move into a Q&A period now. So hopefully I can expand upon uh, some exciting things that you all have questions about. Yeah, absolutely. That was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. And I do have a handful of questions. I'm going to oh, try to organize them in some way that, that kind of makes sense so that they're clustered a little bit. Sure. Um, okay. So I'm going to kind of start with maybe the simplest of the questions, which is, so we talked all about the solar maximum um, yeah. and, and you also end your presentation saying, you know, this is such an exciting time over the next couple of years. So how often does solar maximum occur? Great question. So solar maximum occurs roughly 
uh, once every 11 years. But I should stress that it's not just one year that solar maximum. I kind of like to frame it in a low season or like a winter or dormant season on the sun and then like a high summer or like active season. So, you know, solar maximum is just one point. It's sort of the very tippity top of the mountain. But, you know, you can imagine you're still climbing that mountain. You're still a very high elevation, right? So, you know, the sun is very active for roughly three years, um, you know, sort of around the solar maximum time. So right now, scientists think that we are at that solar maximum, that sort of tippity top of the solar cycle. We won't really know for sure until we start decreasing in activity. Um, but right now we're sort of in that high season. So uh, we've had about a year and a half of, act of really active uh, space weather the past, you know, year and a half. And we're expected to see, you know, another two years or so of really active space weather as well. And actually, there's some really cool research that shows that as the sun sort of goes down from the solar maximum and towards solar minimum um, on this descending phase um, that we see the most extreme space weather. So hmm. we might be in for some more really, really big shows. Oh, that's very cool. And then so yeah. how long, I don't know that you said how long is an actual cycle then? Yeah, so it's every 11 years. So um, every cycle lasts roughly uh, roughly 11 years. It's sort of an average. So it could be anywhere from nine years to 13 years. Okay. And then in the next question, follow on for that one is, is what causes the, the cycling? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is an area of active research. I'm not a, an expert in what's called dynamo theory, but actually it's, a, it's, it's the same way that Earth's magnetic field is created. Um, the sun has sort of this dynamo um, in its center. So, you know, imagine like, I guess, um, these two magnets in the sun center sort of rubbing together uh, creates this global magnetic field that extends uh, out into outer space, just like Earth has a magnetic field, which sort of forms a protective bubble around Earth. The sun has its own magnetic field that actually protects the entire solar system from an interstellar wind. So um, we're talking about interstellar space weather at this point, but um, so the sun's magnetic field um, is, is, is really important to why it has solar cycles, but also the fact that the sun does not rotate at the same rate at every latitude. So what I mean by that is that the equator of the sun rotates at about 24 days, but the poles rotate at about 34, 33 days. So that means that, you know, if you're able to spin up the sun, the parts of the center are going really, really fast and the parts of the poles are barely moving at all. And mm -hmm. when you have these magnetic field lines, they become twisted. As you start spinning up the sun, these magnetic field lines are usually straight up and down, kind of like a bar magnet. But as you start spinning, imagine you're taking that bar magnet and you're kind of twisting it around. And it just so happens that the rotation rate of the sun combined with these twisting magnetic fields um, creates these um, sort of 11 year cycles where the magnetic field goes from really straight up and down, um, kind of like a bar magnet to just jumbled all over the place, which is why we get these magnetic field lines popping out of the sun's surface. And when that happens, that's in the solar maximum phase. So um, the sun rotates on average once every 27 days. If it were to rotate faster, like let's say every five days, our solar cycles might only be two or three years. So um, we're actually able to see that on other stars, these stars that, um, you know, we can sort of image them and we, we can figure out how fast they're rotating. Um, we can actually see big giant sunspots on these other stars outside of our solar system, because the faster you spin up the star, the more active it it will be so um the solar cycle itself you know it's really more complicated than that honestly but it's really a product of the fact that the sun is like a bar magnet and it doesn't rotate at the same rate so you're kind of twisting up these magnetic field lines and you're untwisting them and that you know sort of leads to this oscillating um oscillating activity which we call the solar cycle every 11 years great uh, so then the next question is going to be, um, so when you show a lot of these pictures, we see that the aurora are happening in at different vertical positions um, yeah. in the sky and or in the atmosphere. Um, so what is the cause of their location? Like where, either where we view them or actually where they are in the atmosphere? Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, auroras occur at multiple heights. So really from 60 miles to 300 miles in altitude. And the height of the aurora is determined by how much energy that, you know, sort of particle or how much energy that electricity from outer space has so that it's able to um, go down further in the atmosphere. So um, if you don't have a lot of energy, that particle is going to, you know, collide with all this gas in the upper atmosphere and maybe only make it to 200 miles. But if it has a lot of energy, it's going to 
burrow its way down until it reaches an area of the atmosphere that's thick enough where it'll eventually stop. So um, particles that have a lot of energy might uh, create all these colors along their way down. So they might create red and green and um, purple on the very sort of pink purple on the very bottom that nitrogen fringe. Um, and also, uh, you know, how they appear to us really depends on the perspective, right? So the aurora um, really occur in these auroral ovals that are sort of, um, they, they kind of encircle the geomagnetic poles um, right over Fairbanks, for example, we have, uh, we're right underneath one of the auroral ovals, but places like Iceland and Northern Norway. Um, and then we also have an auroral oval in the Southern hemisphere, which is basically entirely over Antarctica. Um, if you're right underneath the aurora, you sort of just see um, what's called an aurora corona, this aurora just spreading out in all directions. It seems like it's sort of literally raining down on you from a single point. But if you're far away from the auroral oval, you'll start seeing those striations, those uh, sort of green, uh, red, sometimes blue or purple layers. And then if you're really, really, really far away from the auroral oval, you might only see the red because the curvature of the earth starts playing a role. Um, as you go further and further away from the auroral oval, you start only seeing the very tops of the aurora, which are red. So it's very typical during these really, really big geomagnetic storms that although the auroral ovals expand to maybe, let's say, instead of being over Alaska, they're over somewhere like Seattle, right? Um, if you're in Arizona, you might actually be able to see that aurora, just the very tops of it. So it might just appear red. Um, but yeah, the colors are due to the altitudes and also the gases that are being excited. So we breathe oxygen and nitrogen down at the ground. Well, those are found um, all throughout the atmosphere. And uh, those oxygen and nitrogen atoms glow different colors. Um, and those colors are usually just green, uh, red, and blue, but they can mix together and and form essentially an entire rainbow of colors, which we can see in the aurora. That's great. So I'm glad you mentioned Arizona because that's where we're located. Yeah. And so I can connect personal experience with a number of the questions that I also see, which is about uh -huh. photography. So here yep. in Arizona, as you said, you know, we we received red. The, and I think yep. the last time we actually got a little green, but I wasn't here in the state when it happened. And the other thing that we notice is... Um, it was difficult to see with the naked eye, but our camera yeah. could catch it. So there are a lot of questions about like, what is your camera setup? You know, for those who live outside of this space, you know, where you're at, do you actually see it with the naked eye? Is it enhanced by camera? So just kind of tell us about the photography aspect. Yeah, that's a great question. And one that I get so often is, can you actually see it? Because even though you can have these really big space weather storms, the aurora sometimes is, is all over the place, but very, uh, very faint. And what happens uh, is usually that's the case. Usually the aurora is pretty faint. I can pick it out with my eye, but the camera definitely sees more. Um, and then during what are called auroral substorms, it's kind of like a storm within a storm. You have this big burst of activity and the aurora just goes nuts. It, 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 it starts, I wonder if I can pull it up. Um, this was an auroral substorm. A lot of these photos actually are auroral substorms because that's when the aurora looks the best, essentially. But um, this video here on the left was actually taken during one of these substorms where the aurora just goes completely crazy. And you can definitely see the greens. You can see all the colors. You can literally see the ground turning green as well. So, um, you know, cameras will, will pick up more colors when the aurora is really faint because our eyes are just not designed to see in the dark. Um, Cameras do not have the limitations that our eyes have with seeing really, really faint colors. Our eyes kind of turn off the color vision when it's really, really dark outside. So we only see black and white and we just don't see as well in the dark anyway. So we might not even see the aurora. It might just look like a cloud or might not look like anything, but cameras don't have those limitations. You can basically tell your camera to take a, tell your eyes to take a photo for 30 seconds. If you could do that, you could see exactly what a camera could see, but we can't do that, right? We can't control the, the shutter speed of our eyes. <laughs> so cameras can do that. And uh, really long exposures can reveal very, very faint auroras. And uh, yeah, when it's strong enough, you can see all the colors. Um, we had some really, really gorgeous red aurora last week, which I could definitely see with my naked eye. And that was crazy. I had never seen such vibrant reds before. And it was honestly a little bit creepy too. As you look around you and the entire sky looks like this crimson red. It was just very strange. So um, when the aurora is strong enough, honestly, the, the, your, your own eyes do a better job than, than the camera in some, you know, in some aspects, because you cannot see the motion of the aurora with just one photo. So that's something that your eyes have an advantage over. Great. 
And I think we have just two last questions here okay. um, and we've got about six minutes. So that's probably just about right. Um, sure. The next question I have for you is about climate change. So does yeah. climate change actually have any effect on, you know, the amount or the color or any aspects of the Aurora? That's a great question. I know there are a lot of researchers looking into that. I'm not super certain uh, whether or not climate change affects the aurora in a major way, I'm pretty sure, you know, because the aurora is occurring so high up above our heads, you know, it's not affected by a lot of climate change induced weather, right? Um, you know, we're seeing, you know, more extreme, like, you know, thunderstorms, tornadoes and hurricanes and things like that. But the aurora is really above all that stuff and is really controlled by the sun um, and sort of a function of how active the sun is. So I don't think that climate change will affect the aurora in, a, in, in any major way. It certainly will affect aurora viewing. Um, if your area is getting more cloudy, well, you cannot see the aurora if there's clouds, um, you know, over your head. So you might sort of miss out on some displays because of climate change and just having clouds in between you and the aurora. Um, but I think, you know, there are some subtle nuances to that. Um, you know, as we're seeing, you know, changes in the lower atmosphere, those can propagate up to the upper atmosphere too. So these upper layers of the atmosphere where the aurora are occurring might be slightly warmer or cooler, um, you know, over time as the climate changes. So it's possible that there are some minor effects, but actually, thankfully, I don't think climate change will affect too much um, with, with the aurora. Okay, continuing with our theme on cutting edge science here, a uh, question about the Tic Tacs. So yes. the question here is, is it possible that the Tic Tacs are caused by events outside of our solar system? That's a good question. I... That, that would be pretty cool. I do not think that they would be caused by anything outside of our solar system, just because the sun thankfully protects us with its magnetic field. It sort of forms a protective shield, just like Earth does. Um, we have a magnetic bubble around Earth sort of protecting us from the sun. The sun protects the entire solar system against what's coming in from the outside. So um, that sort of boundary in that bubble is way outside of even like Neptune or Pluto. Um, so, uh, I don't think there's anything really coming in, um, from deep into outer space, um, affecting the Aurora on earth. Um, but it is interesting. We can see Aurora's on other planets, um, outside of our solar system potentially. So that is, that is cool. So maybe we'll find Aurora Tic Tacs on other planets, who knows, but I don't think personally, uh, that we're seeing any influence from outside of the solar system because everything is basically controlled by the sun. Outstanding. Well, Vincent, we sincerely appreciate all of your time that you have spent with us today. This was so illuminating, understanding, learning more about the Aurora. Um, and I'm sure I speak for everyone out there. There's some great comments for you in chat. You should probably check those out. Yeah, I will. That's a kudos for you. For those of you uh, back in the audience here, uh, I did drop a survey over in the link. Please do take a few minutes to complete our survey so that we can share uh, your feedback, not only with Vincent, but also to inform our processes. And finally, there's another link. So we have one more talk in the series for the Heliophysics Big Year. I believe this one is happening. Yes, next week. So Wednesday, October 28th at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We'll be talking with Maya Levinson. She is predicting space weather and compu using computational models. She's going to share how she uses uh, computer software to study solar activity and its effects on Earth's magnetic field. The solar interactions can create currents in the ground that might disrupt power grids, pipelines, and other important systems. By using these computer models to understand these effects, Maya's work helps us better predict potential disruptions, ensuring the safety and stability of essential services that we rely on every day. So be sure to register for that, and that we will be concluding our Heliophysics Big Year uh, presentations with Maya. Uh, thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Vincent. We will also send a follow-up email with... Um, a link to Vincent's site that will have all yep. the resources that included, you said it was going to be the presentation. Yep. I'll have everything there. Yep. I'll have it by the end of the day. So um, if they Great. check in a few hours, it'll all be there. So, yep. Outstanding. Well, thanks again. Bye everyone. We'll see you next week.